Hello and welcome everyone to today's Juris Space Solutions webinar. My name is Christy Searle and I will be facilitating this session. For your convenience, there is a chat feature located at the left side of your screen. If at any time you have a question, you may contact me by typing your comment in the text box at the bottom of the chat window and clicking the conversation bubble next to it to send. At the end of the presentation, we will be taking questions from our audience, and at that time, you can utilize the chat feature to ask your question. This session is being recorded and will be made available after the presentation. We're pleased to have you with us to learn more about DuraCloud's integration with the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Joining us today is Matthew Kulberg, the Technical Project and Services Manager for the San Diego Supercomputer Center, Carissa Smith, DuraCloud's Partner Specialist, and our first presenter, Michelle Kimpton, Chief Executive Officer of DuraSpace and DuraCloud Project Director. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you all for, for being with us today. And welcome everybody to today's webinar. So uh, DuraSpace um, is a not-for-profit organization that is, was really born out of academia. It's got its start by being, providing technical leadership and support of the DSpace and Fedora open source community projects. And those are still two very big and robust projects that we put a lot of effort in working with the community. About a year ago, we launched a service, a cloud-based service called DoraCloud. It is available um, for anybody that wants to digitally archive and preserve their content. And that will really be the focus of part of the discussion today as well as our most recent partnership with San Diego Supercomputer Cloud Center. So I will be talking uh, in part about, give you a brief introduction to DuraCloud and some of the features, and then talk about uh, why we are very excited about this partnership. I will then pass it to Matt, who will talk, who is from San Diego Supercomputer Cloud Storage, and he will talk about uh, some of the technical underpinnings of the cloud storage that they have in place, as well as some of the features and benefits, in particular when you commit, compare it to commercial cloud storage uh, infrastructure. And then lastly, Carissa will be giving a demonstration how you would use SDSC Cloud through your DuraCloud service and what are the features and functionalities in particular as they relate to the SDSC cloud. So for those of you not familiar uh, with the DuraCloud service, it is an archiving and preservation software as a service platform that runs in the cloud. We currently run the application in Amazon and we have connected DuraCloud to three storage centers thus far, which are Amazon S3, SDSC Cloud Storage, and Rackspace Cloud. So when you subscribe to a DuraCloud account, you can uh, push your content into any one of those three cloud containers through the DuraCloud platform. We provide you with a number of different mechanisms for getting your content ingested into the cloud and then once you have your content in one of those cloud containers through the DuraCloud platform, you can then seamlessly move content to other cloud stores. So you can have replicated content across one or several cloud stores. And those, that content is all accessible through one DuraCloud web-based uh, web dashboard. So you can view it, you can uh, edit, edit it, and replicate it across those centers pretty easily. DuraCloud today is mainly focused on digital archiving and preservation services. However, there are other services for access as well. So here are a few of the key ones uh, that many of our users uh, are using today. So as mentioned, you can replicate your content across multiple cloud centers, um, and therefore you can have multiple copies in multiple administrations and multiple geographies. So many of our institutions using DuraCloud will have a copy in their local data center as well as a copy in Amazon, and several are now 
putting a copy in SDSC cloud storage as well. That gives them, in some cases, uh, at least five and sometimes six copies in at least three different geographical centers, um, all synchronized and replicated, which is a great way to start to execute a preservation strategy. DuraCloud performs automated file health checking, health checks on your content stored in the cloud. So we run a service on a periodic basis which, which checks the health of your files and compares it to um, the original health as you submitted the, the file and also compares it to the different cloud stores. There are also other services available that are uh, related to access, which would be things like video streaming, image serving, and some of our users will create separate containers in their DuraCloud account so that they can provide access, such as video streaming and image serving in one container, but have preservation backups in another, another container. And because they can set different permissions and rights on those containers, uh, they do not get intermixed. Why DuraSpace is so excited about the San Diego Supercomputer uh, Cloud Partnership is that uh, it is notably the first academic cloud provider that has entered into the space. So they uh, came on board with their cloud service, I believe, the fall of 2011. Prior to that, um, clouds, public cloud stores that were available were, were all commercial. And we're really excited about this because as an academic provider, they really understand our community and what some of the unique needs are in terms of security and privacy and, um, in particular, transparency as well. So we've been able to work with them to understand uh, at a more, at a deeper level, um, how they manage their content, what their policies are, how they do health checks internally. Uh, what the process is to replace corrupted files if they find one, um, what levels of security and protocols they have in place. And Matt will share some of this with you today, but it's been very refreshing to deal with um, somebody in the community that not only speaks the same language, but is very open and transparent uh, in talking to us about what they do and what they don't do, um, which is very different than our conversations at times with with Amazon. Uh, and even if Amazon is has a process in place, many times they won't put it in writing because they don't want their competitors to um, know at that at that level what they're doing. And in some cases they don't want to be accountable for it. So it's refreshing to have a, an academic provider um, on the landscape. We um, we also note that San Diego Supercomputer Cloud is actually more cost competitive than Amazon. Their prices for storage are actually lower. And we think that that's great. And that is a great um, alternative then to using commercial cloud. And lastly, we've been excited because it's a real partnership in that we're not only partnering with SDSC to offer cloud storage, but we are looking down the road to be able to run DuraCloud Compute on the SDSC platform when that's available. And we're talking about how we could partner to offer other services that would be of interest in the community. So SDSC is really focused on building and scaling large infrastructure. And DuraSpace, through the DuraCloud platform, adds a layer of services that the academic community, particularly our community, the library community, are interested in um, in terms of archiving and preservation. And that layer really opens the door, that layer of services opens the door for many more users to easily access the cloud storage um, than they would have done otherwise. So SDSC is excited about that aspect of the partnership with us. In terms of the uh, pricing, I thought I'd, I'd bring this up because we get asked this question a lot. So this is a pricing sheet right out off of our website. So when you sign up for a DuraCloud account, you would typically choose the Preservation Basic or the Preservation Plus. And the Preservation Basic is $1,500 a year for your 
first terabyte of storage. So if you compare, and that, that gives you access to all the Jira Cloud services, such as the, um, all the ingest tools, the content being stored at Amazon, the health checking reports, um, ability to share online, all of the services are included. And if you look at that cost, $1,500 per year, it is actually on parity with the cost of storing a terabyte at Amazon. So Amazon, if you do the math, costs you $1,524 uh, to store one terabyte of data for a year. Um, and then our costs go down after that. So really there's no <coughs> downside, there's no cost penalty to using DuraCloud. Um, and then you get, in addition to that, all the benefits. If you choose the Preservation Plus, you get a copy of your content in Amazon and an additional copy in SDSC. Uh, so for $2,500, you get four copies of your data in two different data centers under two different geographies and administrations, plus all of the services that are included in the DuraCloud platform, the health checking, the file replication, the synchronization, um, without having to set up different interfaces or ingest processes at those two different cloud providers. So through DuraCloud, we make it really easy and cost-effective to execute um, a component of your preservation strategy. And so we think that by doing that, um, it will enable many more institutions to actually put a preservation strategy or plan in place, uh, which was difficult um, without this type of service because you don't need any additional technical resources, you don't need technical infrastructure, and it is very cost effective. So as I mentioned, uh, the DuraCloud service has been available for about a year now. We have many institutions using DuraCloud to back up their data and also some institutions using it as a, a primary store for data that they're just taking off of disk and don't have <coughs> place in their data center to uh, manage it. These are a few of the institutions that are using uh, Dur that are using DuraCloud and backing up content into two data centers. Um, <clears throat> so they're using Amazon and SDSC to make those four copies, as mentioned. <clears throat> and we just came online with SDSC about two months ago, I believe, in production. So these are some of our early adopters of the Amazon and SDSC uh, cloud stores. The other uh, reason that we are really excited about having SDSC as a partner is because ultimately our vision is to really build a full academic cloud network. And what we foresee is SDSC um, being one of those partners, but we, we believe that other academic clouds are going to emerge. We know that University of Chicago has been working on it. We believe Indiana has been working on it. Um, and so we hope to be able to work with these academic cloud storage and compute centers to build this digital archiving network, where DuraCloud provides a layer of services on top of that network, and then they are connected through Internet 2 or other academically controlled um, Internet uh, backbones. So today, we're working with um, Internet 2. Uh, and we are working with SDSC, and we hope that we can encourage other universities to get public cloud storage and compute uh, so that we can build out our vision. Okay, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Matt, and of course, um, we'll be here to answer any questions after it's done. I know we didn't talk a lot about DuraCloud. It is a very tight schedule today. However, there are many online resources to get a better understanding of DuraCloud, the features and the services, uh, and we'll expose those at the end of the thank presentation. Michelle. All right, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I'm excited to be here and excited to see so many participants in the conference call today. Um, as Michelle said, my name is Matthew Kahlberg. I'm a technical project and services manager at the San Diego Supercomputer Center been here since 2000 and love being here and I'm excited about this project. Um, we're really excited to be partnering with DuraCloud um, 
the, the Zero Cloud service provides an easy way to leverage the SDSC cloud storage and make it accessible um, to all of the academic community uh, at, at, a, at a really great price and with a, a nice, easy-to-use interface. Um, SDSC offers a lot of cyber infrastructure services in support of research and academic advancement, uh, but the cloud is one of our, our flagship services that we're really excited about uh, and glad that we can be bringing it to, to the academic community. So we began development on the cloud in about mid-2010 when we realized an overwhelming need for a cost-effective solution uh, that we can offer to educational and research entities for data storage, archival, preservation, um, with, with a support uh, and understanding of what the real needs are for educational institutions. Uh, we officially launched the cloud in September 2011 uh, as the largest academic storage cloud with 5.5 petabytes of initial capacity. Uh, since then, we've provided about a petabyte of storage um, throughout the academic community, and that's growing constantly every day, which is really exciting uh, to see a, a great uptake in the service and, and the need for, for large-scale storage. Um, so in order to support this project, we looked at several different cloud hosting options. Uh, you know, we looked at what Amazon was doing, uh, looked at what Rackspace was doing, and ultimately, we decided on an open source platform called OpenStack, which was developed through NASA and a Rackspace collaboration. Uh, and so far, that's worked out very well for us. I just want to give you a, an idea of why we chose that software. It's been well and widely accepted throughout the computing community uh, as a viable storage background, back end option. Uh, Excuse me. And we're seeing it being used in, in a lot of different industries, uh, both both uh, for-profit industry use and in the educational environment. Uh, it's the same software that Rackspace uses to host their software, just in an open source format, uh, running under the Apache 2.0 license. And because it's open source, we're not locked into a specific technology due to cost, uh, and there's a lot of community development for the service. And because it's a modular design, we can integrate these new community developed services and features to it as we expand the service and uh, increase the offering throughout the academic community. So to give you an idea of, in the background, how the OpenStack works, um, pull up my little arrow here, and you can see that once data comes in into the cloud, we've got authentication nodes and proxy nodes. The authentication nodes determine who you are and uh, whether or not you have access to the resource that um, you're requesting. The proxy nodes then relay the request to the storage nodes in the background, which then deliver the content back out through the proxies, and then to the user requesting it from the internet. When data comes in, after it's handed off from the proxy nodes to the storage nodes, every single bit of data is written twice, one to one set of uh, storage nodes and another copy to a different set of storage nodes. This provides a level of durability by having two simultaneous copies at all times. Uh, and that, that's important um, as far as ensuring the, the durability and the integrity of the data um, over time. So where is this cloud? Uh, the San Diego Supercomputer Center is an ORU of the University of California, San Diego. Our building is located on the main campus. Um, we've been here since oh, 1985 when we started as a uh, NSF-funded supercomputer center, and we've transitioned into um, a multi-constituent cyber infrastructure resource center. And we provide services to all of UC, other educational institutions, uh, and, and to the uh, general academic community and, and industry. 
the actual cloud hardware is stored within uh, our SDSC data center, which is a 1,900 square foot uh, data center with you know, about 13 megawatts of available power, uh, which is pretty impressive, and we're, we're really excited about the, the opportunity to, to leverage this data center for uh, research needs and, and for things like hosting this cloud storage. The data center has a very high level of network connectivity. We have 10 gigabyte connections to many of the educational research networks, uh, such as Internet2, ESnet, uh, National Lambda Rail, Future Grid, and, and several others. As far as the security of this equipment in the data center, which ultimately relates to you know, potential security on the data stored in the cloud, the data center is monitored 24-7 by on-site operations staff. We have 60 closed-circuit cameras and a very cool hand vein pattern biometric access um, to gain access to, to the center, uh, although access is restricted quite a bit. so. It's not like anyone can just walk in off the street. Uh, so it's a, a well-secured uh, building and data center. The cloud is also backed by a uh, un uninterruptible power system, a UPS, that provides 3.5 megawatts to the cloud infrastructure and the data center as a whole. This is important. You, know, you never know when there's going to be a power problem. Um, and having that battery backup allows us to ensure the integrity of the data and be able to safely shut down the system in, in the event of an emergency. And lastly, in the data center, all of our hardware is on um, seismic isolation platforms from a company called Isobase, which being in San Diego, you know, we always have the potential of an earthquake down here, and these isobases allow the hardware to move independently from the floor, uh, keeping them much safer during an earthquake situation. Um, and it, it, seeing those in action is, is pretty pretty impressive. If, and if you'd like to take a look at that, there's several videos out on YouTube showing how these machine rooms react during an earthquake um, when using these ISO-based equipment. Um, so it's pretty interesting. Check those out. So once you've uploaded your data to SDSC, what does it do while it's here, uh, while it's vacationing in our data center? Uh, so all objects or files, so cloud storage is, is what we call an object-based storage system, uh, and, and files are then referred to as objects, are always continually checked for errors to ensure that these two copies that I mentioned are always equal and valid. Um, and, and confirm their checksums uh, continuously. When the system detects that a copy has gone bad, uh, it will locate the other copy and immediately replicate it to a third set of storage to ensure that those two uh, copies are always present and, and valid. That always raises the question of what happens to data? Why does data go bad? What can occur? Um, and then really it's just a, it's a fact of life with storing data on spinning hard drives. Um, the generally accepted concept is that every 10 to the 15th or every quadrillionth bit written will be written incorrectly or will, will result in an error. And this is known as the unrecoverable bit rate error. It's something that, as I said, is just a fact of life. and data will have errors. So maintaining these two copies and doing this continuous checksum uh, prevents any data loss due to that unavoidable situation. Secondly, your data, while it's at SDSC, remains private at all times. Um, the only way for data to be accessed by anyone but the account holder is if you were to share it out yourself, um, which is a, is a major function of the cloud. We want to make data accessible um, to those people who you want it to be. Uh, we want it to be easy to access and fast. So the, the option to share your data is there, but unless you do, it remains private. SDSC will never mine the data for any, any reason, um, be that for our, our research, um, research on data storage, any commercial purpose, 
nothing like that. Um, so you, you know you can trust that while your data is at SDSC, it's, it's secured and held privately. And lastly, all of our staff who work with the cloud system undergo, undergo several background checks, um, consumer, w world check, live scan, and we all have level C level clearance. Um, so you know that the people working on the hardware here and who have access to the data are, are confirmed and verified as quote unquote safe. So what are the benefits to adding SDSC to your data profile, to using SDSC through uh, DuraCloud? The, the most obvious is increasing your redundancy. Um, as Michelle said, you can have up to six copies uh, spread across the country in different geographic locations by using Amazon, SDSC, and Rackspace all together. Um, Secondly, and again, as Michelle said, we, we both understand the needs of academic institutions. We're familiar with how academic data is created, how it's you know, the, the best way to store it, and the needs of sharing that data. Um, the, um, pardon me. <coughs> uh, OK, so uh, I'll move on. Um, Another great feature for the SDSC storage is that we are able to provide this at a very low cost while still offering the same level of availability and durability that you would get from Amazon, Rackspace, or any other commercial cloud providers. We just don't have a lot of the overhead um, that they do, and we're not out here to make money. Uh, we're not here to compete. We're here purely to help academic institutions manage store, and share their data. Um, it, additionally, if you leverage us through the Dura Cloud service, you can easily move your data between clouds, choose to have your data on multiple clouds um, for that increased redundancy we talked about. And it provides a great fund end to managing um, the amount and location of your data storage. We're also recognized by many of the central funding agencies, including the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Health. Uh, the, the cloud is a, is a recognized entity uh, and is a great resource to use when creating your data, data management plans, grant proposals, and funding proposals. And in general, partnering with SDSC for your storage helps support the academic community and computing research and the general um, academic research as a whole. So our mission really um, in, in providing the storage is uh, three parts for data curation, archiving, and preservation. Um, those are the areas where we put our focus in supporting the academic community. Um, and just a, a brief overview of what those are and how they're different. So we look at curation as uh, managing data to keep it useful and available for people to um, reuse, recompute, and, and access in support of additional research um, and you know, not reinventing the wheel to use data that already exists. Then archiving is Selecting exactly which data is appropriate and best to be shared and ensuring that that's stored in a way that it's accessible to researchers um, and students and other educational entities uh, to be reviewed but kept in the same format and uh, with the same level of security as it originally was created. And lastly, preservation is ensuring that this data is stored in a way that it's reusable in the future, that the technology supporting it um, and that allows you to access it remains viable, and that, this de uh, that the data um, is stored in a way that as technology progresses, you can still open it, read it, view it, um, listen to it, you know, depending on what, what sort of data we're talking about here. 
uh, you know, we, we've seen a lot of advancement in, in technology and uh, as, a, as a case, I used to work with a researcher with about 1,800 zip disks. And I don't know if how many of you remember zip drives, but um, was, was speaking to them recently. And at this point, all of that data is completely inaccessible, not readable in any way. Most of those zip disks has failed. So ensuring that we're preserving data in a, an environment that will be continually accessible in the future um, it is very important. So Michelle covered a little bit of what what applications people use the cloud for. Uh, so I'll go through some of, of what our most popular applications are. Um, of course, we're doing shared and, and curated data collections. Uh, the cloud is great for, for storing those for, for long-term archival and in, as well as for sharing them externally to um, to the public and to other educational institutions. We also use the cloud as a uh, an upload and download point for HPC computing so we can move data quickly in between our compute environment and the storage environment uh, and then make the data immediately accessible uh, to other researchers or, or publicly, uh, reducing the time to get your data out there, uh, to one, store your data, and two, to get it out there publicly uh, and, and share, the, share your results. Next, because the cloud um, is, is HTTP-based, it, it functions great as a web and a portal service and can host static sites. Um, while it's not a, a, a POSIX file system, it can't do dynamic sites. It, it does a really good job at standard um, static site hosting or sharing the information that you've got in the cloud or other locations. Uh, the cloud can stream uh, the images, video, things like that linked out from your, your static site hosted in the cloud keeping everything all in one place with easy access to it. Um, there's multiple ways to access the data as well, of course. Um, DuraCloud offers uh, their web interface and API access to manipulate your data to get it up into the cloud easily. And then once it's there, you've got those options for static site hosting, sharing it out directly from the cloud, um, or just storing it there securely. <coughs> And lastly, and, and probably one of our, our most popular uses of the cloud right now is for backup services. There are several backup clients out there that can directly leverage the cloud storage as its backend storage, um, making your, your, your backup um, plan simplified. Um, you've got accessible and expandable storage that your backups can easily dump directly into um, and quickly be pulled back out. Uh, certainly a, an advancement over using what we've seen as tape storage um, or, or other backup services going to uh, slower and less accessible storage locations. So what's on the horizon for us? Uh, as Michelle said, we are entering into development of our OpenStack compute environment. And this is really exciting um, as a service that SCSC can offer to, to academic and educational institutions, as well as, as Michelle said, it allows us to be a DuraCloud primary storage option. Um, we're, we're really excited for that, for that to come out. Um, SCSC's cost is as she said, quite a bit lower than what you would see from Amazon. So offering us as a primary storage option uh, creates a, a much more cost-effective solution um, compared to some of the, the, the uh, corporate offerings that we see out there. We are also expanding our, our cloud into a second data center. We're calling that right now SDSC North Cloud. That is going to be hosted up at Oakland. Um, it will be a second site for our cloud storage. 
and that will also give the potential uh, to offer a second geographically dispersed location through the DuraCloud service and directly through SDSC. Uh, just increasing your, your durability that much more um, by you know, theoretically adding on another two copies. If you were to go with all of the DuraCloud offerings, that's eight copies across the country, uh, giving you a, a, a very high level of, of data security and, and integrity. And lastly, in order to improve the performance, um, we're always always making upgrades to our, our cloud storage here. Um, most recently, we've decided to install solid state disk drives into the cloud nodes. This improves the database activity performance for things like logging in, requesting files, listing containers, <coughs> excuse me, and uploading your data. Um, and it relieves some of the load that we would have on the otherwise have on the storage servers. So we're, we're excited to complete this project and uh, see how much faster we can make this cloud storage. So I hope to see everyone in the cloud very soon. Um, if you're not storing your data there already, um, we hope you uh, contact us or, or contact DuraCloud and see what we can help you with and uh, help solve some of these these large-scale storage problems. Uh, we, we love big data. So uh, if you have any questions about uh, my talk, about the cloud infrastructure, feel free to email me. My email is up on the screen. And if you want to go ahead and get signed up, visit the DuraCloud site, and they'll walk you right through it. Thanks. And I will pass it um, back over to Michelle or Carissa. I'm going to take over for you. Thank you so much, Matt, for your great portion of the presentation. So as Michelle mentioned, we're going to do just a quick demo of the DuraCloud interface as well as its direct integration with SDSC. So wait one moment while I stop sharing the screen. Bear with me while I transition to my desktop here. Christy, let me know when you can see the DuraCloud login screen if you could. And then I'll get we're ready to go. Thank you. So as Michelle mentioned, DuraCloud is indeed a web application that we host in the cloud and that integrates directly with the various cloud storage providers that were listed on a previous slide, Amazon, SDSC, and Rackspace. So I'm simply going to log in here for a moment, assuming I type my password correctly. Um, one thing I'll note before I log in, as a customer of the DuraCloud service, your account would be located at the URL of your choosing. So today I'm logging into the demo.duracloud.org account, but of course um, you could customize that to your institution named at duracloud.org as a customer. I'll wait, pause for one moment while my interface loads here. I want to get to the correct screen. So the first thing I always do uh, when, when conducting demonstrations is orient you to the screen that you see in front of you. On the left-hand side, you'll see, of course, the DuraCloud branding and the DuraCloud logo. But directly underneath that, you'll notice the Amazon Web Services logo. And that gives you a visual indication that the content that you will see in the interface below that is being uh, currently stored within Amazon S3's cloud. Directly below that, you'll see a list of spaces. And uh, space is just a term that we use in, in DuraCloud land. Um, that's analogous to a content container, a content bucket, essentially a, a top-level uh, folder, if you will, that, that holds all of your content in the cloud. And if you happen to click on one of these uh, spaces within the interface, um, you'll see that the interface itself comes to life and has a lot more information available to you. In the center of your screen, you'll see the list of content items that are currently stored within this Carissa folder test space. There are three, and I'll, I'll draw your attention to that. Uh, for uh, for the moment because it will become come in handy here later. So there are three uh, content items stored in this space currently. On the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see the details uh, about this space. The right-hand side of your screen is always the detail panel, and it depends on what you've selected, what details you will be presented with. Um, I won't walk through all of the details, as there are quite a few that our interface reports back to you. I'll just touch on the, the most important ones for today's demonstration. So again, you'll see the item list at three for this particular space. 
And then uh, a couple lines below that, you'll see the date that the last um, check of the health was run. So our integrity health checking uh, integrity services run on a periodic basis, as Michelle noted, over all of the storage providers that DuraCloud is integrated with. And you can see that the last time the service was run was just this morning. I had a, a new report run. And you can see that, indeed, it was a success, meaning that these three content items are uh, very healthy in, in Amazon. And if you click on the report at the end of that green bar, you'll see a list of all of the content that's currently held within that space and the valid uh, MD5 checksum comparison that was made. So again, this is the Amazon interface. And what I really wanted to, to, wanted to demonstrate today is the integration with SDSC. So you might have noticed up here in the top right-hand side of your screen the provider pull-down window. So if I hover over the provider pull-down window, you'll see uh, the two other options that are available, SDSC and Rackspace. And I'm simply going to click on SDSC to navigate to the SDSC storage area in DuraCloud. I'll pause for one moment while my interface uh, updates for everyone. As you might have already observed, the interface looks remarkably similar. Uh, one, one of the difference being that here on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see the left, or excuse me, you'll see the SDSC uh, cloud logo, giving you again an indication that now you are in the SDSC uh, storage area of your DuraCloud account. If you click on that same uh, space name as was stored in Amazon, again, uh, the interface will come to life. You'll see a list of those same three uh, content items stored in SDSC. And um, I'll note the same three because our service, the DuraCloud service, is automatically synchronizing content that gets added to Amazon over to SDSC on your behalf. So as a customer, if you sign up for uh, a direct integration with Amazon and SDSC, any content that you load into DuraCloud will automatically be replicated or synchronized to SDSC for you. So you don't even have to manually think about uh, the, the content that's being uploaded and then, and then synchronized to SDSC. Uh, DuraCloud handles that for you. A couple things I will also note here in the SDSC um, portion of the interface. Again, the three content items, of course, as well as the last health check that was run over the content in SDSC. And again, uh, I did run this, the health checking service uh, uh, earlier this morning, but it was run over both Amazon and SDSC. And again, you can pull up the report for the SDSC uh, health integrity check for these content items as well. So again, uh, the interface and, and how you interact with uh, DuraCloud is exactly the same regardless of which storage providers you've chose to have your account integrated with. I'm going to navigate back to the Amazon storage area here for one moment to finish up my demo. One of the most important features, I think, that um, I usually save to the end of the demo is how you actually upload your content into DuraCloud. How do you get it in the cloud? And we provide one of many options uh, to load your content into DuraCloud, depending on your use case. Um, probably one of the most straightforward ways is this Add Items button that appears here in the center of your screen after you click on a space. That allows you to select um, client-side content, whether it be multiple files or folders, and upload them all through this web browser to DuraCloud. So it's probably one of the most straightforward ways in which you can add content to DuraCloud. The, the second way uh, is through one of two client-side utilities that DuraCloud offers uh, free of charge. They're available with our documentation. One is the client-side upload utility, which I will demonstrate today. And the other one is the synchronization utility, which is also another client-side tool that allows you to perform ongoing local synchronizations of content to your cloud content. Um, it is a true synchronization uh, utility. And then the third way that I believe Matt brought up is through the DuraCloud REST API. You can programmatically interact with DuraCloud and add your content, or even customize your own integrations with your own homegrown solutions to back up your content to DuraCloud. So with that, I'm going to quickly demonstrate the DuraCloud Upload tool, which is, again is a client-side utility. I've brought it up on my screen here. It, uh, of course, asks you for the name of your account as well as your username and password so it can actually authenticate and add the content to DuraCloud. And then it also asks you for the exact space name where you'd like your content to, uh, to reside in DuraCloud. So if I click Continue here, one moment, I mean I typed everything in correctly. 
you'll see uh, the Duracloud Upload Tool in action. I simply click Add Files and Folders uh, down here on the left-hand side of the screen. And I can navigate to my local machine and choose a content item of, or as many content items as I'd like. I'm just going to choose one simple one to demonstrate today, a, a JPEG image. And then down here in the bottom right, I simply click Start Upload. And the uh, Upload Tool will give you uh, a nice feedback um, as it as it uploads the tool, and it will also give you a report when it has completed uploading the content, as it does, as, <laughs> as it just did. I don't know if my screen was quick enough to capture that, but it did give me a status bar, and then now it says that it has uploaded this file successfully. So I'm going to close out of that for a moment. If I click Refresh here in the DuraCloud interface itself, in the space where I just uploaded that content item to, you will see that now instead of three content items, there are going to be four. And that Cloud JPEG image did indeed make it to DuraCloud. And I will just confirm that for everyone. If I click over here and click View, you will be able to see that content item uh, as it's stored in DuraCloud. So let me get out of that. And then, remarkably, if I choose uh, SDSC from the Provider pull-down window, and again, navigate to that same space uh, as was in Amazon, you will see, if I refresh, that the content item will also appear here in SDSC as well, that same upload uh, cloud.jpg image. And again, this, uh, this just demonstrates that our service automatically uh, synchronized and replicated that content that I had originally added to Amazon over here in SDSC on the fly, without you having to really even think about that it was happening in the background. And again, I can view this content item from SDSC as well. Um, of course, the interface, the DuraCloud interface itself, uh, behaves in the same exact manner as it does in Amazon. So again, that was just the really quick 10-minute <laughs> demo for everybody um, regarding the uh, DuraCloud platform as well as its SDSC integration. I'm going to navigate back to uh, Adobe and finish up the presentation with a few slides in just one moment. Bear with me here. All right, so as Michelle mentioned, to find out more about DuraCloud, we encourage you to visit the DuraCloud website, of course, or our DuraSpace uh, and DuraCloud area of the wiki, which is the second bullet on the slide in front of you. Uh, that has all of the, the tools that I mentioned today, as well as documentation about DuraCloud and how you use it. Um, however, I would highly encourage you visiting the DuraCloud YouTube channel, which again is the third bullet on the list. If you're interested in learning more about the user interface that I just uh, demonstrated, there are a lot of great clips uh, regarding how to use all of the, the various tooling that I mentioned, uh, as well as run some of the services. Um, if you want to learn more about our automated bit integrity checking services, uh, we, have, we, have <laughs> we have recordings of training sessions and uh, brown bag sessions and webinars all on the DuraCloud YouTube uh, channel. Of course, Michelle and I would encourage you to email us if you have any other uh, additional questions outside of uh, today's presentation. Uh, our email addresses are on the screen. And then uh, I'll just give you a little snapshot of the DuraCloud website. And again, we encourage you to contact us or to sign up for a free two-month trial of DuraCloud. Um, again, uh, we, we heartily encourage uh, folks to try out DuraCloud free for two months to get an idea of how it might fit uh, at their institution if, if you have any questions about that. So with that, I'm going to pause my portion of the demonstration, and I think we're going to open up the floor for questions and take them in uh, as they've come in. I will, I will start to verbalize the ones that have come in through the chat to uh, both um, Michelle and Matt. So if you guys want to come off of mute, I will start um, addressing some of the questions that I think have come through. Um, I believe our first question that had came through got answered by Matt. Have you considered offering an option for storing a single copy that will be duplicated at two sites? I think Matt went through that. Um, and how SDSC handles that um, in particular. Uh, the next um, question that seemed to come through the chat was regarding the slide with the U.S. Uh, network, preservation network that Michelle showed. Um, with just the vision of the academic cloud network in, in the U.S., which is great, um, but, but Linda Newman wants to push the envelope, and how about a node across the pond in the Atlantic or the Pacific? So this probably question is addressed to Michelle. Yeah, hi, Linda. I, I think that that is 
a great idea. We can certainly do that in terms of cloud storage uh, and keep compute is available overseas. Um, I don't think Internet2 has international partners as of yet, um, but I'm not completely 100% sure of that. So it's, I don't think that's out of scope or out of the vision per se, but I guess I've been more focused on at least getting the U.S. network um, up and running first. It's a great, great point. Okay, so the next question I believe will also be geared towards you, Michelle. Does Duraspace offer video streaming as part of the preservation package or the preservation plus package? Uh, yes, you can, video streaming is an option in either of those packages, although um, potentially there is an additional cost because there is no, um, the streaming service itself is free, but we would have to put in a budget for um, access. Um, of the streamed video. We do have that incorporated in our enterprise, but not in the preservation, but the service is available as an option if you would like it. And there's actually, I did a really great brown bag session that shows how you can stream media through DuraCloud as well as then embed those media streams into your own application. So not to really keep hard, <laughs> to keep floating my own boat about the YouTube channel, but um, there are a lot of really great videos that, that would answer that question as well. Uh, the next question from Sheila on the list is uh, directed towards Matt, and she's asking if the UBE um, rate that you know, that you quoted on your slide was ex um, experienced at SDSC, or if that's just an industry standard or average. Sure, that that is an industry standard. Um, you know, it's not a not a guarantee, but that's typically what um, what the industry sees for enterprise grade hard drives. Um, for commodity drives, you know the the hard drive you've got in your in your desktop computer, um, it's a little bit uh, more frequent at 10 to the 14th um, bit rate. Um, so this is something that uh, we've certainly have seen here. The the cloud has, um, I believe, four or five times over the past year um, found a bad file that it had to re-replicate from the second copy. Um, and that, that also goes back to Tyra's question about is, is one copy an option? Um, and it, it's certainly theoretically an option, but we we don't feel secure um, maintaining single copy at a, at a site um, uh, because of that, that problem um, and just an overall desire to ensure the integrity of that data. Well, there's a really great follow-on question for you, Matt, that I think will be tan tangentially related. Um, are the two SDSC copies in the same machine room? Yes. Currently, with uh, just SDSC South Cloud, um, both copies are stored in the same machine room on different sets of storage servers. Uh, once we have our SDSC North Cloud up in Oakland, you would have two copies in our data center and two copies um, in the North Data Center if you did select that as an option. On to the next question then. Thank you everyone for adding these to the chat feature and we will keep addressing them as they come in. Uh, the next question from Anne is, is there any overlap with Chronopolis systems or tools? And I'm going to pass this one to Michelle in particular. Uh, yeah, so Anne, I'm assuming you're talking about um, does DuraCloud integrate with Chronopolis? But then there is SDSC and Chronopolis overlap as well. So I'll answer the DuraCloud part. So DuraCloud is currently in beta, in a beta integration with Chronopolis. We actually have one customer, North Carolina State Archives, that will be putting their content there. Uh, so what that means is that they upload their content to DuraCloud. They have a copy of that content in San Diego Supercomputer Cloud. And then a snapshot is taken from their content in SDSC and put in the Chronopolis system. So um, that's where the integration point occurs. And then you can get visibility um, to that Chronopolis content through DuraCloud. I don't know if Matt wanted to jump in with any of the SDSC Chronopolis um, project or any other information about that. Uh, so. uh, I, I'm not aware of any. Uh, direct integration with Chronopolis to DuraCloud, um, but the the Chronopolis 
storage definitely uses, um, it was started um, jointly with SDSC and does use the SDSC cloud storage as one of its storage locations. Oh, the SDSC cloud is one of the storage nodes in Crowdflux, and that's why we were able to do that integration with Endura Cloud pretty easily. Yep. Okay, the next question on the list um, from Dan, and I think uh, Matt and I can both address this. Uh, have you had a file check report show some problems? So from DuraCloud's perspective, in the, the three years that we've been either beta testing or had DuraCloud in production, we haven't experienced any integrity issues from content stored at the various cloud providers at this point. So the answer, the quick answer to that is no, we haven't had a, a health check report show problems with content that's stored at any of the uh, cloud providers at this point, but obviously we're not trusting uh, that to continue on, as as Matt rightly pointed out uh, in in his slide with the the bit corruption rate. So not quite yet, but we we don't anticipate that ha that lasting forever. Uh, what about you, Matt? Any any health check report is issues uh, at SDSC? Um, no, no. Ultimately, lost data. We have had a couple of instances where one of the dual copies. Um, has had a problem and has been replicated from the primary, or, or not, not primary, but the other copy. Um, there's no no specific primary copy, um, but but we have seen uh, the effects of that that UBE uh, a couple of times over the over the development of the cloud. But with the continuous file checking, it's it's certainly not a not a issue to, to be concerned about. That's why it does it, and um, it's, it's to be expected to some extent. All right, the next question on our list, and we'll breeze through them here in the last few minutes of today's session. Uh, Dan asks, if there are any limits on file size for uploading, and I'm assuming this came in when I was demonstrating. Um, within DuraCloud, based on the storage providers themselves, we do have a five gigabyte limit uh, in terms of the sizes that we can store. However, from a realistic perspective, um, we found that chunking files at the one, one gigabyte to two gigabyte range is more realistic, especially based on um, our customers' local bandwidth that they have available. So typically, we recommend uh, our tooling enables chunking of large files into the one uh, gigabyte range just so that you can transfer those uh, over, the, over the internet. And And then uh, a follow-on question also from Dan. You mentioned video streaming services. Do you mean an actual video streaming server like Adobe's? Um, the DuraCloud streaming services leverage Amazon CloudFront, so you can upload um, both audio and video files into DuraCloud and stream them uh, via Amazon's CloudFront and then um, embed them into your own applications. Um, I hope that, that serves to answer your question, Dan, and, and I'm not exactly sure what if there was any additional information that you were hoping to get. Uh, and if you do, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, now let me catch up on the chat here. Um, Ron Hawkins had a clarification point about SDSC. The SDSC cloud by design stores two copies at each site, i.e. there will be four copies total at SDSC San Diego and SDSC Oakland. And then going through the chat, we've got a few more questions. I'll try to get through them as quickly as possible, folks, so thank you for your patience. Um, how does upload speed compare with download speed? Is it the same? Um, that's really contingent on your on your local bandwidth, Dan. Um, we haven't noticed any, any differences within the DuraCloud interface itself. Um, again, uh, typically the uh, connection to the Internet uh, is where we've seen uh, differences. And, and I, I would agree with that. We, we haven't seen any differences um, uploading and downloading local. But of course, if you're at your home internet, your, your upload um, is restricted quite a bit more than your download. So as you said, um, it is dependent on your, on your location. Yeah, so we've, I'll just comment with Michelle. We found that typical upload and download speeds, or the ability to upload or download files, is really controlled by your university, um, by your IT group. And that's one of the things that we're trying to overcome by working with Internet2 directly to make sure that we've got 
clear pipes available when people want to do very large uploads and downloads, and it's not being ratcheted down uh, by the IT department. All right, on to the next question. Um, are health checks kept so we can see a long view of them, or are these checks from upload onward? Um, so the interface that I showed you, uh, Tira, you, uh, the storage reports and also the integrity reports are automatically replaced every, um, every time that those checks are run. However, we do store all of the reports in an administrative space in DuraCloud. So yes, we keep them, um, but the nice little green bar that you see always gives you the latest uh, checksum report or health check report, latest and greatest. And then I think we're at the end uh, with just one last question. Um, and I'm not, this is for Matt, uh, so you must be keeping a record of what the checksum should be separately. Is that correct? Uh, yes. The, the checksums are stored um, on each of the, I, I believe it's the proxy nodes. Um, it, it may be the storage nodes. I, it's a uh, question for, for the actual storage development team. I, I'm not positive, um, but it is stored in multiple locations. Um, across the cloud, so it's not on a single system. Um, it's, it's distributed throughout the, the infrastructure of the cloud. And there was one last question that came in to me separately um, offline, and that is for Michelle. You mentioned the University of Chicago's cloud that they were working on, and uh, an audience member wanted to know who at the University of Chicago, if there was a particular department or research group that was working on that, if you could mention it. Uh, sure, it's the Open Science Data Cloud, and we've been working with a gentleman there who, um, it's, I think it's OSDC is the website, uh, but they're really interested in integrating with DuraCloud for storing and managing uh, primarily research data that's coming from libraries and other uh, stewardship institutions. So they're they're kind of getting up and running now, but we hope to see them online in a production way. Well, thank you to all of our uh, attendees today for participating in the webinar and all of the great questions. Sorry for running over uh, a little bit uh, over time, but we appreciate your participation in today's webinar. As Christy mentioned earlier, we will be posting both the slides and the recording on DuraCloud, DuraSpace.org, as well as our YouTube channel, of course. Here I go mentioning YouTube again. Um, we'd also encourage you to fill out the survey that Christy just posted in the chat as well, just to give us feedback about how we did the, the content that we went over today and what you'd like to see in the future um, from the DuraSpace Solutions webinar as well as DuraCloud webinars. So again, thank you all for your participation today. Don't hesitate to contact myself, Matt, or Michelle if you have any further questions, and we will have our email addresses on the slides as well as in the recording. So thank you all, and have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank everyone.